from New York, the makers of Clipper Craft Clothes for Men, and 1036 leading retail stores from coast to coast, present the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Our stories are based upon the character of Sherlock Holmes, created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sherlock Holmes is played by John Stanley, Dr. Watson by Alfred Shirley, and the dramatizations are by Edith Miser. Well, here we are as usual, toasting our hands in front of Dr. Watson's crackling fireplace. Mm, feels awfully good. Say, I thought my right hand would drop off. It got so cold tonight holding my hat coming down the street, Doctor. Mm, let's see, Mr. Harris. Yes, slightly nipped, perhaps, but uh, no real signs of frostbite. Well, yes, reminds me of a patient I once had. Now, his hand was in a really bad way. Not from the cold, mind you, but from an encounter with a heavy and not too blunt instrument. Holmes always called it the adventure of the engineer's thumb. <laughs> I thought you were leading up to a story, Dr. Watson. The adventure of the engineer's thumb. Sounds sufficiently bizarre. Oh, it was, Mr. Harris, it was. Strange in its inception and dramatic in its details. Yes, I don't think I can do better than tell you that one. It began with one of the goriest patients any doctor ever had collapse in his waiting room. And it ended with Holmes getting himself in the tightest spot he was ever called upon to get... Oh, but uh, hadn't you better say a few words first? Thank you, Doctor. You'll go far and wide, and you won't find quality clothes so modestly priced as Clippercraft. Because even in the face of rising markets, Clippercraft has kept its prices down. This has been possible for just one reason, a big reason, the famous Clippercraft plan. The Clippercraft plan concentrates the buying power of 1036 of the nation's finest stores from coast to coast, providing year-round economies in manufacturing and distribution. Cost of production is cut way down and you are the gainer. That's why you pay less for Clippercraft. Only $40 and $45 for a Clippercraft suit. Only $40 for a top coat or overcoat. And only $26.50 for sport jackets. What's more, they're available at your own local independent store, where you get friendly, personal attention. See for yourself. Compare them with clothes selling for many dollars more. And now, Dr. Watson, will you go on with your story? It was in the summer of 89, Mr. Harris, uh, some little time after my marriage. After that important event, you remember, I abandoned Holmes and our Baker Street rooms and returned to civil practice. Oh, I still dropped in on him, of course, and now and then I even persuaded him to forego his bohemian surroundings and come and partake of a respectable Sunday dinner with Mary and me. And how did he and Mrs. Watson get along? Splendidly. She adored him, Mr. Harris. Well, uh, I had settled down and become a respectable married man. Practice steadily increasing and all that. My house was no great distance from Paddington Station, and I had a few patients from among the officials. One morning, a little before seven, I was awakened by the maid rapping frantically at my door. Dr. Watson! Oh, Dr. Watson, sir. Oh, uh, hello, yes, come in, come in. Oh, Dr. Watson, come quick. Oh, what's up, Millie? What's happened? <laughs> An accident, sir, a nasty accident. Here's his card. Hmm, Mr. Victor Hatherley, hydraulic engineer, 16A, Victoria Street, SW. Yes, sir, walked over from the station, he did. I let him in. He's downstairs now in the consulting room. Looks like death, he does. Well, it can't be too serious if he had the strength to walk over from the station by himself. Looks like he's in pain, sir. It's his end, his left end. Bandaged up with a handkerchief, it is. And it's all a-dripping with blood, Oh, sir. dear, dear, dear. Sounds more serious than I suspected. Millie, you might go and heat some water. I'll go, go right down to him. Yes, sir. Hmm, severe hemorrhage. Wonder what the accident was. Oh, Mr. Victor Hatherley. Good morning, sir. Good morning. I'm sorry to wake you up so early. I had a serious accident during the night. I came in by train this morning. They told me at the station that you were a good doctor. I came here. A night journey. Hmm, that in itself is a rather tiring and monotonous affair. You couldn't call my night monotonous. Monotonous? I never had a less monotonous night. <laughs> Stop it. Stop it. Pull yourself together. I, I, I'm sorry. I have been making a fool of myself for the 
the relief, you understand. I, I apologize. No, no, not at all, not at all. Often happens in a case of shock. Here, take a swig of this brandy. <coughs> that, that's better. Uh, now, let's have a look at your hand. It's my thumb, Dr. Watson, or rather what used to be my thumb. Here, take a look. Good heavens, this is a terrible injury. Flesh badly mangled. Will it have to be amputated? No, no, no. I think we can save it. Mm. Unpleasant wound. Must have bled considerably. Yes, it did. I, I guess I fainted when it happened. When I came to, I was still bleeding, so I tied one end of a handkerchief very tightly around the wrist and braced it with a twig. Excellent. You should have been a surgeon. Well, just a question of hydraulics, Dr. Watson, and well within my own province. Mm. Must have been done by a very sharp and heavy instrument. A uh, cleaver, Dr. Watson. Accident? No, an attacker. A murderous attack. Dear, dear, that sounds serious. Yes, I, I shall have to tell my story to the police, I suppose, but between you and me, I doubt if they'll believe my statement. Problem, eh? <sighs> well, if it's anything of that nature you want solved, I strongly recommend my friend Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Mr. Sherlock Holmes? I, I've heard of him, of course. Do you think he'd be interested? Could you, could you give me an introduction? Oh, I'll do better than that. I'll take you around to him myself. But uh, first, let's attend to this thumb. Then we'll call a cab and drop in on Holmes for a bit of breakfast. <laughs> Another bit of Mrs. Hudson's omelette, Mr. Hatherley. Uh, no, thank you, Mr. Holmes. <laughs> I feel a new man since Dr. Watson banished my hand, and your excellent breakfast has completed the cure. Good. Now you can tell us your story, if you're sure you feel strong enough. Well, I'll take up as little of your valuable time as possible. To begin with, I must tell you that I'm an orphan and a bachelor residing alone in lodgings here in London. By profession, uh, a hydraulic engineer, I had seven years' experience with the firm of Venner and Matheson before I decided to go into business for myself. Well, <clears throat> the start of any new firm is always rather slack, I suppose. Uh, so far, I've had uh, three consultations and one small job. Not what you'd call a rushing business. Well, uh, no, not exactly. Every day from nine till four, I waited in my little den until at last my heart began to sink and I began to feel I should never have any practice at all. Uh, well, I know that feeling. <laughs> <laughs> Would you believe it? The first two months after I resumed my medical practice, I hardly... Watson, knew Watson, I... Watson, don't interrupt. Oh, sorry. Go on, Mr. Heatherly. It all began yesterday, just as I was thinking of closing up for the day. My clerk came in to say that there was a gentleman waiting to see me on business. His card gave me the name of Colonel Lysander Stark. Well, I told the clerk to show him in by all means. Hmm. Colonel Lysander Stark. Picturesque name, eh, Watson? Uh, what sort of man did he turn out to be? Slightly over middle height and exceedingly thin. I don't think I've ever seen a thinner man. His whole face sharpened away into nose and chin, and the skin was drawn tightly over his protruding cheekbones. Hmm. An invalid? No, Mr. Holmes. I should say just naturally uh, emaciated. His, his eye was bright. A trifle too bright, I thought. His step brisk and his bearing assured. He spoke with a slight German accent. I have the honor. This is Mr. Victor Hatherley Nichtwa. Uh, why, yes, Colonel Stark. Uh, won't you sit down? Thank you. You are recommended to me, sir, for a young man who is clever. And also discreet. Well, uh, well, thank you. Not at all. I know also that you are an orphan, bachelor, and you live alone. Quite correct, but I, I don't see why that can possibly concern you. I understood that, that it was on a professional matter that you wanted to see me. Yagavis, I have a professional commission, but I must insist on secrecy, absolute secrecy. And that is easier from a man what has no family. If I promise to keep a secret, Colonel Stark, you may depend on my doing so. You promise, then? I promise. Good. Now we can get down to business. Uh, one moment, please. Yes, it is as it should be. These clerks, you know, sometimes they are so interested in the affairs of the master. Uh, bring your chair close to mine. Huh? Mm, uh, very well. Yeah. Now we can talk with safety. Uh, but if you don't mind, Colonel, my... My time is valuable. So? To whom, then? I know how much work you have done lately, my young friend. Oh. <laughs> you do not fool me. How does 50 guineas for a night's work strike you? Why, uh, well, that's very generous, Colonel Stark. I have said a night's work, an hour's work would be more correct. Your opinion is all we ask. Oh. I have a hydraulic press. It is in bad order. You show us what is wrong, we fix it ourselves. 
You will do that, huh? Why, uh, of course. Good. You will come tonight by the last train? Where to? Air Force, that is in Berkshire. Your train arrives at 11.15. A carriage will come to meet you. Oh, your place is out in the country? Yeah, a good seven miles from the station. Uh, there's no train back. You will spend the night. Yes, but couldn't I come at a more convenient hour? Uh, tomorrow in the daytime? Impossible. It is for your inconvenience that we pay the 50 guineas and for the secrecy. Well, of course, but perhaps if you could explain the reason for all this, uh, this caution... Very uh... well, I explain. You know, do you not, that Fuller's Earth is a very valuable product and is to be found only in two places in England? Uh... Why, yes, I believe I have heard something to that effect. Some yeah. time ago, I have bought a place, a very small place, you understand. And one day, I am so fortunate, I discover a small deposit of Fuller's Earth in my backyard. Congratulations. I investigate. I find it is a link between two so much larger deposits. But in the property which belongs to my neighbors, <laughs> these people, they do not know the value of their land. So you bought it up? No, Mr. Hatherley. I am not a rich man. I have not the money. So I speak to some of my friends, and we work our little deposit in secret, so we can earn the money to buy the land near us. Yes, but I don't understand what use you can make of a hydraulic press in excavating Fuller's earth. We, we compress the earth into bricks, so we can remove them without showing what they are. That is a detail, a mere detail. So, I have taken you into my confidence. I expect you tonight, Mr. Hatterley. I shall be there, Colonel Stark. Good. Not a word to a soul. It is best you do not even tell anyone that you are going away. Very well, if you wish it. I not only wish, I insist. Ah, here is twenty guineas in advance. Well, are we the same, Mr. Hatterley? Sounds fishy to me, eh, Holmes? Fifty guineas is a suspiciously large fee for a small job like that. Quite, Watson, quite. Hydraulic presses, eh? Hmm. Did this emaciated German colonel have a scar on his forehead? Uh, what? Why, why, yes, now you mention it, I believe he did. Ha, I thought so. Then you know who he is, Holmes? I can guess. I can guess. But uh, go on with your story, Mr. Hatherley. You reached Erford at 11.15? Yes, Mr. Holmes. As I passed through the station gate, I found Colonel Stark waiting for me. Without a word, he hurried me into a carriage which was waiting for us both. We got in. He drew up the windows on both sides, tapped on the glass, and away we went as fast as the horse could go. One horse or two? Only one, Mr. Holmes. Did you observe the color? Yes, I saw it by the carriage lamps as I was getting it. It was a chestnut. Tired looking or fresh? Oh, fresh, fresh and glossy. Mm. Well, we drove for the better part of an hour. And from the rate at which we were going, I should say the distance we covered was nearly twelve and seven miles. Yes, interesting. What did the countryside look like? It was a dark night, Mr. Holmes. I saw nothing. Moreover, the carriage windows were made of, of frosted glass. Sounds funny to me, eh, Holmes? Mm. The roads, were they smooth or bumpy? Decidedly bumpy, Mr. Holmes. We lurched and jolted terribly. Moreover, we seemed to be going continually up and down hill. Well, finally, the bumpy road was exchanged for the crisp smoothness of a gravel drive. The carriage came to a standstill, and I got out. Can you describe the front of the house? Now, I'm afraid I can't, Mr. Holmes. I was whisked into the front door so fast I could see nothing. The instant I crossed the threshold, the door slammed behind us, and I heard the rattle of the wheels as the carriage drove away. Minna? Minna? Yeah? Yeah, come. Uh. Bring a lamp. Ah, that is better. It is not nice to keep our guests standing in the dark. So, the rest could come. Yavis, take the lamp into my study. Now, Mr. Hatterley, if you will be so good, come with me. Mena, you can go now. Yeah, I can. My sister, Mr. Hatterley, a good girl. She does what she is told. And now, you will excuse me a few minutes, please. I come right back. Of course. I... Make yourself comfortable. Hmm. Gloomy-looking hole. Smells musty as though it hadn't been lived in for a long time. All the windows shuttered and barred. Confound that clock. Wish it wouldn't tick like that. It gives me the jumps. Oh, hello, I... It is only me. Please, do not call out. I must tell you oh, something. It's all right. Please don't look so frightened. No, no, it is not all right. You must go. You must not stay here. 
there is no good for you to do. Yes, but I came to inspect the machine. I can't leave before. No, you must. You can do no good. The last man who came, he... Oh, this is too terrible. Lena? Lena, where are you? Quick, oh, God, this villain, before it is too late. Quick, this way. Lena! Lena! Down this passage, not that door. It's so dark. Lena, who are you talking to? How do you run? So, you let him go, huh? Please, you will not hurt him. Won't hurt him. Wait till I get hold of him. Wait. He's coming. Run. Run. Well, I got a glimpse of him coming after me with a cleaver, and I ran. Ran for dear life. But he ran, too. I just managed to scale the garden wall before he got to it. Even so, I wasn't quite quick enough. That cleaver came down on my left hand before I could get away. What a filthy black I crawled over to some bushes as best I could and then promptly fainted. Funny he didn't come after you and finish the job, eh, Holmes? Well, the bushes hit me, I guess, but someone must have found me sooner or later. It must have been the girl, or perhaps she bribed the coachman to help me. What makes you say that? Well, when I came to, the sun was just rising. I was lying in an angle of a hedge along the high road, and just a little lower down was a long building. The Erford Station. Well, I'm blessed. Half dazed, I went to the station. The early morning train was just pulling in. I boarded it and returned to London. What I can't understand is why I should have been lured to that lonely spot. And what reason Colonel Stark can have had for making his murderous attack on me? Yes. Interesting little problem. We shall have to look into it. Oh, by the way, I have a newspaper clipping I think might interest you. Uh, Watson, hand me last year's index. That's a good fellow. Right, sir. Here you are. Let me see. January, the Limehouse Plague. Lady Waterfield's Pearls. February, March. Ah, yes, here we are. Read this. Last on the 9th of May, Mr. Jeremiah Haling, age 26, hydraulic engineer. I say, that's a coincidence. Left lodgings at 10 o'clock at night. Has not been heard of since. Was dressed in grey tweeds, soft hat, black boots. Yes, yes, I suspect that represents the last time the colonel's machinery needed overhauling. Then that explains what the girl was trying to tell me. Undoubtedly, your colonel is a cool and desperate man, Mr. Heatherley. He lets nothing stand in the way of his little game. And, like some of our early pirates, he believes in leaving no survivors behind from a captured ship. Good heavens. Oh, I have had a narrow escape. Quite. He'd have killed you sooner or later in any of it. Well, Holmes, uh, what are you going to do? I think I shall run down and have a look at that machinery for myself. But, Holmes, that's just putting your head into the lion's mouth. Yes, I only hope the lion hasn't run away. Well, at least let me go along. Well, you can come as far as Erford Station if you like. I may need reinforcements. And I'm coming too. But your wound... Oh, better... rubbish. I feel 100% improved. After all, this is my problem, and my curiosity, if nothing else, won't let me take a, a passive part in its solution. Very well. Come along, both of you. We've barely time to catch the 10.45 train. Well, here we are, Holmes. Erford Station. Now what? First of all, we must find Colonel Stark's house. I, uh, I mentioned the name to the station agent in passing. Said he never heard of it before. Yes, it's an assumed name, of course. The gentleman in question is famous for his aliases. Well, then, how are we to find the house? I brought an ordnance map of the surrounding country. Of course. I drove ten miles at the most twelve in that carriage. All we have to do is draw a circle with a radius of twelve miles and... This station is its center, then visit all the places within that limit. Yes, rather a tiresome job. I think I can lay my finger on it without all that bother. Oh, you formed your opinion. I bet I know it's in the south. The country's more deserted there. No. I'd say east. I seem to remember driving east. Wrong again. Then it was west. There are several quiet little villages over there. No, it wasn't west. Well, then I'm for the north. There are hills there. Mr. Hatherley said he drove up and down hills. <laughs> Well, you've completely boxed the compass between you. You're both wrong. Mm -hmm. That's impossible. Not at all. This is my choice. It's here we shall find the house in the center of the circle. The starting point itself. What about the 12-mile drive? Six miles out and six miles back. Then that drive was just a hoax. And there, if I'm not mistaken, is the house. Almost across the road. You're right, Mr. Holmes. I'm sure you are. What? That's the very same wall I vaulted last night. And, and there, further down the road, are the bushes I hid in. I thought so. Well, I'll go over and have a chat with our friend Colonel Stark. Mr. Hatherley, you and Watson stay here. Why can't we go with you? Impossible, my dear Watson. I don't want to frighten Colonel Stark off before I have a look at that machine of his. Yes, but you're not a hydraulic engineer, Mr. Holmes. You wouldn't understand it. He'll suspect you immediately. I have a fairly good knowledge of hydraulics. I think it will see me through. However, if I'm not back inside of 15 minutes, you may come and get me. I may need assistance. <laughs> Good 
Most men are loyal customers of the friendly local store in their community, the store they can trust. Therefore, it's doubly pleasing that this fine independent store, the leading establishment in town, sells Clippercraft clothes. It's nice to get all the advantages of group buying at the store of your choice. And it's mighty easy on your pocketbook, too. The Clippercraft plan concentrates the buying power of 1036 stores from coast to coast, bringing you beautifully tailored Clippercraft suits at only 40 and 45 dollars, top coats and overcoats at only 40 dollars, and sport jackets at only 2650. Yes, selling expensive clothes at inexpensive low prices at the nation's finest independent stores is the great big idea behind the Clippercraft plan. That's why men who know insist on Clippercraft clothes. So be sure to visit the Clippercraft store in your city. These leading stores in the metropolitan area are proud to add their names to Clippercraft in your suit, top coat, and overcoat. In Manhattan, Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th. John Wanamaker Men's Stores, Broadway at 8th and 67 Liberty Street. In Brooklyn, Abraham and Strauss. In Newark, New Jersey, Boulevard Men's Shop, Kresge, Newark. And in Jamaica, the B&B &B Clothes Shop. 16408 Jamaica Avenue. And now, back to Sherlock Holmes. We find him at the door of the mysterious Colonel Stark. Confound it, you don't suppose he's made his getaway. Who are you? What do you want? Oh, how do you do? Colonel Stark, I presume? I've come to repair your hydraulic press. You, you, how dare you? Well, you see, a friend of mine, Mr. Hatherley, told me of his experience here last night. I, I said I thought he was a fool to run away like that, that you must have mistaken him for someone else last night when you chased him in the dark. Yes, uh, yes, uh, that is so. A, a suitor of my sister, a good-for-nothing scoundrel. It was all a mistake. Just as I suspected. And when Mr. Hatherley said he wouldn't come back, and when I learned what a fine fee you'd promised him, I thought, why not come and have a look for myself? Of course, why not? You two are a hydraulic engineer? Naturally. Very well, you may come in. Ah, trunks and boxes in the front hall. We're about to leave this neighborhood? Yeah, uh, the, the English climate. It is bad for my sister's health. We go to the south of France. I wonder if I might see your sister. So sorry. She is in her room. She is not well. Oh, just for a moment. Hatherley seemed to be worried about her. Said he thought you might have mistreated her last night after he got away. Uh, ridiculous. Of course, but uh, if I could just see her, I could reassure him he, uh... Seem to want to call in the police. Uh, the foolish young man. Uh, but come, I, I let you see her. This way. She shall tell you herself that she is all right. That's very good of you, I'm sure. I wouldn't dream of troubling you myself, but you see, young Heatherly is... A... This is her room. Minna? Minna? Yes? See, Minna, I bring a gentleman who is anxious to know if you are all right. Uh, tell him how you feel, huh, Minna? I'm well, thank you. I'm delighted to hear it. You see, my friend Mr. Hatherley was worried about you. Mr. Hatherley? The young gentleman I mistook for someone else last night. Oh, how is he? He's all right. Why, yes, of course. Oh, I'm so glad. Hold on a minute. Look here. Those bruises on your neck and arms. Has anyone been treating you badly? Uh, that was from falling downstairs. Amina? Uh, yes. I see. Well, Colonel Stark, suppose we take a look at your hydraulic press. Certainly. Of course. This way, please. Uh, goodbye, Fräulein Stark. I hope you'll enjoy the south of France. The south of France? Yes. Lovely climate. Well, goodbye. This way, the press is on this floor. Here we are. Hmm. Gigantic affair, Colonel. Yes, it is capable of exerting enormous pressure. The sides are all of iron. Yes, very impressive. I pull the lever so. The water flows into the cylinders, you hear? But there's a leakage somewhere. Yes, loss of power. Yes, that third driving rod, the rubber banding around the top, seems to have shrunk. It doesn't quite fill the socket. 
course. How stupid of me not to notice for myself. Yes, it would have saved you a lot of trouble, wouldn't it? You can stop the machine now. Let's have a look at the inside. Very well, if you wish. You can enter here. Hmm. Very impressive. Like a prison. Hello, what's this on the floor? Metallic deposit. Wasn't it Fuller's Earth you're supposed to be mining? Yes, I thought you might see that. Ah. Goodbye, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Great thunder, he's locked me in. He started the machine. The ceiling's coming down on me. Well, Sherlock Holmes, you let yourself in for something this time. Closer. Closer, you wouldn't think it could move so fast. In a few minutes, it'll grind me to a helpless pulp. Better not think about it. I can reach it now. Down. Down. No good trying to push it back. I've found it. I can't stand up any longer. Well, then, sit down, Sherlock. Lower. Lower. If I lie on my face, the weight will crack my spine. No, the other way will be less painful. Please, mister. Minna, where did you come from? Here, near the floor. A panel, it's open. By Jove, another outlet. Hurry, hurry, do not talk so much. You can get out. The opening's pretty small. Quick, quick. Yes, I... I can just squeeze through. There. Oh, God said, thank you, are safe. <sighs> pretty close shave. Oh. Hear that? The presser has just hit the floor. Another minute in there, and I'd have been ground to a pulp. So, Minna was the good angel a second time, Doctor. Yes, the great girl, that Minna. Hatherley took quite a fancy to her. In fact, she eventually became Mrs. Hatherley. Oh, and her brother? Oh, Hatherley and I caught him on his way out as he was making his getaway. He's uh, still in prison, serving a life sentence for attempted murder and counterfeiting. What a ghastly story, Doctor. So that was what the hydraulic press was used for, counterfeiting. Yes, of course, Holmes suspected it from the first. Naturally. And now, Dr. Watson, would you like to give us a hint about next week's adventure? Uh, next week, I think I should explain why the ancient statue of Charles I, which stands in Charing Cross, holds a modern sword. I may even tell you how the original sword threatened the life of one of the premier dukes of England. The makers of Clipper Craft Clothes and 1036 leading stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes is produced and directed by Basil Lochran, with special music by Albert Berman. If you don't know your Clippercraft dealer, write Clippercraft, 200 Fifth Avenue, New York City. Give your child a run for your money. Join the March of Dimes. Send your dimes and dollars to your local March of Dimes headquarters. Keep your kids in the running. Join the March of Dimes. Be sure to listen next week to Sherlock Holmes in the case of the Avenging Blade. If you'd like to attend the Sherlock Holmes broadcasts in New York, see your local Clippercraft dealer, and he'll tell you how to obtain your tickets. Cy Harris speaking for Clippercraft Clothes. This is the world's largest network serving more than 450 radio stations and mutual broadcasting systems.